Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session, Best Practice Use of Dressings and Compression Therapy Across Practice Settings, an illustrative case series. This is supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare Medical Solutions Division. My name is Heather Hetrick, and uh, joining me today is Emily Greenstein and Kathy Milne, as we will be, pre be presenting this content for you. These slides are just uh, a list of our disclosures for your reference. So our goal for you today is to examine the best practices for use of dressings and compression and to explore illustrative case studies on the use of dressings and compression to optimize healing for a variety of wounds. So with that, let's get started. I will be presenting on compression best practices. Well, it's always important to start with what is compression, right? And basically it's a bandage or a device that applies a pressure on the external surface of a limb, which is then internally transmitted to the internal tissues where it causes change. Now pressure affects all deformable structures of the extremity. This can include blood and lymphatic vessels, fluid content in the tissues, and even the tissue composition itself. Now the dose or the amount of compression is what impacts the effect. Proper selection and use of compression supports the hemodynamics of the AVL systems, or what I call the veil, which is actually the venous, the arterial, the integumentary, and the lymphatic systems collectively, as it helps to also remodel the tissue. Now, there are a lot of factors that influence the level of compression. First, there's the physical or textile properties of the bandage material itself, the number of layers applied, the width of the bandage, the tension applied during application, and this is all kind of referring to Laplace's law, if you remember your physics, the consistency of the application, the size and shape of the limb, the location and chronicity of the edema or swelling, and also the presence of wounds or any integumentary dysfunction, as well as the activity level of the patient. So there are many different compression choices, as you can see listed here, and there is no current consensus regarding the most effective compression therapy technique. But what is important to remember is compression should really be divided into therapeutic compression when you're trying to reduce the extremity or when you're trying to manage the integumentary dysfunction versus maintenance, because oftentimes you will use different combination of compression modalities during those various times. Now let's talk a little bit about some compression options. First, we have elastic, which is also known as long stretch. And it's long stretch because it provides almost greater than 100% of its own extensibility. It also induces a high resting pressure and a low working pressure, which is not the most optimal when we're trying to support the lymphatic or vascular structures. An example would be ACE bandages or circular knit compression garments. There are also non-elastic or inelastic, what we refer to as short stretch bandages. Now these only extend up to 40 to 60% of their normal extensibility, and they provide a low resting pressure and a high working pressure, which is really optimal to support the hemodynamics of the system. So examples of these would be short stretch bandages. There's many different products on the market for that. Flat knit compression garments, and even the Velcro adjustable products, which are currently on the market today. And the other type is the rigid or no stretch, such as gauze um, or even the Unaboot to some extent. But remember, each system is different and it's really matching the compression profile to the needs of the patient from a clinical perspective. There are also combination of materials. So we have the cohesive two-layer systems, the multi-layer two, three, four-layer systems, and the multi-component systems as we commonly see in lymphedema wraps during that intensive phase of complete decongestive therapy. There are layered garments that are effective for ulcer when there's an active ulcer. There's hybrid liners um, and a lot of other layered products that have an increased pressure, but also increase the stiffness. And that static stiffness is really the dynamic effect of what we're trying to achieve when we're talking about compression. The other thing that's important to consider are all of these items listed here on this slide for you. And I'll just highlight a few of them and I'll let you read the rest yourself. But it's critical 
prior to performing any type of compression application is that we do a thorough vascular assessment. Now, hopefully that involves doing an ankle brachial index, or if you're unable to do that in your clinical setting, at least a referral to a vascular clinic where a lot of these assessments can be done because we need to appreciate the arterial health of our patients as well as the venous health. We also need to prepare the extremity from an integumentary perspective and also look at the shape and the anatomical architecture of the extremity to prepare it for compression. We need to assess for protective sensation. You know, is the patient going to be able to tell if the compression is too tight or it being too restrictive? We need to consider balance, footwear, their hygiene, their judgment, cognition, and safety, understand uh, of their medical condition and why we're using compression, because all of this can help achieve adherence to wearing compression regularly. The other important factor is, can the patient manage the compression? Are they able to take them on and off? Compression isn't effective if it sits in the drawer. So we need, again, to match that compression to the, pa to the patient. And this can be enhanced by training the patient and how, or, their, or their caregiver on how to properly apply or don and doff the, the uh, compression, but also have them return that demonstration uh, to monitor for their effectiveness. Cost, of course, is important. Um, sometimes we need to consider custom fit. Uh, it, typically that can be best to achieve our outcomes, but it can also be the most expensive. And it really comes down to matching the compression to the patient, because we always say some compression is better than no compression. There are a few other compression considerations to take into account. Flat knit type uh, compression garments are a lot more comfortable for patients, but they tend to be a bit more expensive. We also find these to be more efficacious for our patients with the disease of lymphedema. It's also important to remember that garments, whether they're custom or over the counter, should only be used after the edema plateaus. So we wanna achieve that initial reduction um, ensure good integumentary health, and then determine whether over-the-counter or custom garments should be used for that maintenance phase or the lifetime management of their condition. Alternative wraps, which are the types uh, that can be self-adjusted um, to accommodate for fluid changes, are very effective um, and useful for patients that have difficulty with donning and doffing, whether it's due to um, grip strength or uh, range of motion or whatever the case may be. And the nice thing about alternative wraps is that they're safe to use during um, all phases of edema reduction, both in the treatment phase and also the reduction or the maintenance phase. Now, interestingly, Medicare usually only reimburses for compression if a wound is present. So it's good to account for that in your plan of care um, to get that uh, compression ready or on order uh, prior to complete wound closure. Garments should not be used, as I stated before, to reduce the edema, but to maintain that edema, edema reduction. And stockings and garments are for day use uh, when patients are up and active and moving. Alternative wraps can be used day or night, as, as stated, as they're, they're adjustable and also short stretch by nature. So how does compression work? Well, the goal of compression is to have a therapeutic effect on the hemodynamics of the limb. Venous pressure diminishes continually from the periphery to the heart. At the ankle height of a person who is standing still, it measures anywhere from 90 to 110 millimeters of mercury, but it really can depend on gravity and the distance of the heart to the foot. So size does matter with respect to the patient's height. As we move, pressure decreases to about 20 millimeters of mercury as long as the system is sufficient. So appropriate therapeutic compression must provide enough external pressure to exceed the hydrostatic pressure in the vein. So really effective compression narrows the veins or think of it as approximating those valves in patients with venous disorders. External pressure that is needed in the upright position is really 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury to achieve this goal. This is why a lot of times you'll hear that 30 to 40, 30 to 40. Um, and again, it's, it's while uh, the patient is, is upright. Now, we do have to consider what it takes for a complete occlusion to occur. And basically, if a person is in rest and supine, complete occlusion of the vessels can be achieved at 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury. 
Um, in sitting, it can be at 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury. And in standing, it usually happens when it's over gr or greater than 70 millimeters of mercury. So you just need to think about this in the activity level of your patient to help you best um, understand that the amount of compression that, that should be applied given their clinical presentation. We also know it's important to look at uh, how we classify venous disease. And the common approach to this is using the SEEP model. Now, what's important with this is you can see the SEEP represents uh, C0 all the way to C6. And SEEP really stands for uh, the way we a review or, or describe venous disease, looking at the clinical presentation, the etiologic presentation, anatomic and pathophysiologic, and together that stands for SEEP. But what's important is you don't have to wait for the clinical signs of edema, which typically occur at the level C3, to initiate compression. Patients with C0, 1, and 2 benefit from compression. Even though they may not have overt signs of edema, they've got, particularly the C1s and C2s, have venous changes that would benefit from the supportive nature of compression. Now, the other important thing I want to point out is that when a, per when a patient presents with a C3, so that initial presence of edema, or higher, that's actually a phlebolymphedema, which is a combination of venous disease in combination with lymphedema. So we're calling that now a phlebolymphedema. So why this is important is the lymphatics are essentially damaged from chronic venous insufficiency. And when you look at what happens, the etiology of the insufficiency of the venous system is due to valvular failure of either the deep, the perforating, or the superficial veins. And when those veins can't approximate, we get regurgitation of the blood in the vessels, which leaks into those surrounding tissues in the lower part of the leg. Now, this increases capillary function due to increased pressure on that AVL system, the arterial, the veins, and the lymphatics. This, in turn, creates a dermal backflow of lymphatic fluid. So what you start to see is a dual outflow system failure. It's a failure of the venous system as well as a failure of the lymphatic system. But take it a step further that Dr. Mellon likes to say, and that is actually a tri-system failure when you account for the associated integumentary dysfunction as well. So this tri-system failure, it's important to understand. And disorders of the lymph system, whether they're systemic or localized, produce cutaneous regions of skin that are susceptible to infection, inflammation, and even carcinogenic changes. This is known as skin barrier failure, or essentially a lymphatic dermopathy. So these systems are very interrelated. So when there's compromise or dysfunction in one system, it's safe to assume there's dysfunction in the other systems as well. And I think this is nicely represented in this picture on the right of the slide, which shows you the arteries in, labeled A, the veins labeled V, and all that translucent material surrounding it are actually the lymphatic vessels. And you can see that close approximation that those vessels have to the venous system and even the arterial system. So by nature, also the lymphatic system developed out of the venous system. So when there is dysfunction in the venous system, Oftentimes there is associated dysfunction in the lymphatics and vice versa. The other important thing to consider as I'm trying to change my slide here, sorry, like you can see the uh, other bullet points there is the um, guidelines for therapeutic compression. Now guidelines are really recommendations for compression, do compression dosage, which is really the resting interface pressure. And it's found, uh, these guidelines are found throughout the literature and they're categorized related to the underlying conditions being managed. And what I've done is basically uh, presented them to you in a bulleted form below. Now, again, these are not prescriptive, these are guidelines. So for example, 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury would be considered a very light compression for those with just very early leg edema or even those C, C1s and C2s that we just talked about all the way to 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury, which is really indicated or suggested for patients with severe edema, severe venous disease, the presence of venous ulcers, and even lymphedema or DVT. So you, it's again, important to understand the clinical presentation of what's going on with your patient, and then trying to match the compression profile to best achieve your, your uh, goals and your outcomes. 
So I actually um, want to also highlight the, uh, that there are guidelines that have been published with, the, with regards to the use of compression for those with an associated peripheral arterial disease or patients with a mixed disease. So they have a combination of venous and arterial disease. Again, this is why understanding your patient's venous health is so important um, or vascular health, I guess I should say. So doing that ankle brachial index or referring out for a vascular workup is really essential because we know anything lower than an ABI of 0.8, we have to be very cautious with our compression application. And even um, an ABI of 0.5 really warrants further investigation and, and modification of the compression we're going to be using to make sure that we use it safely and not cause any further damage potentially to that underlying arterial disease. So when a patient is actively reducing edema or has the presence of, or, of integumentary dysfunction, usually the two layer bandage systems are optimal. And there's lots of reasons for this as uh, it's listed here. But it's important to remember too, for those patients with mixed disease, modified compression can be used if the systolic ankle pressure is more than 50 millimeters of mercury or a toe pressure of greater than 30 millimeters of mercury. Now you may be asking, well, what's toe pressure? Some of our patients, um, such as say patients with diabetes or anybody with calcified vessels may not have an accurate ABI reading. It may be artificially high, appearing as though they might have a normal vascular system. So in that instance, um, it's recommended for patients to get a toe brachial index because for some reason, this, the vessels of the, of the toes do not calcify like the larger vessels of the lower leg. So a toe pressure of greater than 30 is in, indicated that it would be safe uh, to use compression on those individuals. So again, Really important to understand the clinical presentation of your patient and then applying some of those practical recommendations based off of how they're presenting. And I do want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the science behind two layer compression because this is a great option to use, especially during that active reduction phase and also when there's the presence of venous insufficiency ulcerations or other integumentary complications. There's a lot of very good evidence to support the use out there. Um, Moffitt in 2008 said uh, she found the highest level of evidence supporting the Coban two-layer compression system compared to other products. Um, Lutz in uh, 2013 found the safety of Coban to light compression was demonstrated in patients with ABIs of 0.5 to 0.8, which was wonderful because we now have a product that we can use on those um, really questionable ABI values, right? And it, it provides still enough compression to be supportive, but safe in the presence of that mixed disease. So the Coban 2 light system really provides a very beneficial effect on that dermal capillary system to help achieve that reduction. So there's good evidence supporting the use of uh, Coban out there. Other articles um, and research studies uh, in by Mosty, by Vauden and by Lampru all again highlight the importance and benefit of using something like the Coban 2 product or these two layer products, particularly in those early stages when you're trying to get that reduction, you're trying to manage the integumentary dysfunction. And what's nice about these products too is that they have a very low profile, meaning the patients can often still wear their socks, they can wear their shoes, they can wear their clothes um, without really any inconvenience with additional bulky uh, devices or materials at hand. So very good evidence to support the use of Coban-like uh, products and Coban specifically. I do want to leave you with a very good and comprehensive resource that was published um, in 2019. Um, it's, it's an open source document. It's called STRIDE, which stands for SHAPE, Texture, Refill, Issues, Dosage, and Etiology. And this basically covers absolutely everything you would want to know about compression, literally from A to Z. And I, I really strongly recommend it. You can see the resource or listing there, but you can Google it and, and download a free copy. It's, it's a very, very good resource, um, whether you're new at compression or an expert at compression, just a great, great tool to utilize because we have so many compression choices out there. This kind of helps really make those decision processes a little bit easier. And it's, it's helpful to share with the patients as well. And um, with that, I'm gonna leave you with a few slides uh, on my references so you can see where a lot of this material was pulled from. 
And now I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Kathy Milne. She's going to be providing you the uh, topic on best practice use of dressings with a particular focus on foam dressings. So without any further ado, Kathy, welcome and thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you, Heather. And I can't say enough about that stride document. It's just fabulous. And I'm, I'm glad you're sharing that with all the audience today. So um, my name is Kathy Milne. I am an adult nurse practitioner and I actually practice across the continuum. I see patients in the acute care setting, do a day a week at a wound center. I go to long-term care and I also make house calls for the truly homebound. So I, I have a lot of opportunities to see lots of different foam dressings. I also get to see that venous ulcer across that continuum because they really do change from setting to setting. And talking about settings, you know, we, we have these goals that we think we should be managing, right? So the acute care, we just want to stabilize that one. A lot of times they come in with cellulitis. Uh, they may go to the LTAC or short-term rehab where we're really trying to optimize the patient and the wound and maximize both their ADLs, but control their edema and uh, control the bio burden and get that wound ready to heal. Then they're really transferred into home health, where we're really trying to get them to increase their ADL, increase their activity. And we're actually trying to teach them better habits so they don't uh, have that edema swell back up again. And we're also probably sending them to the wound center so they can help us guide our care and they may need advanced therapy. The problem is, is in um, the, across the continuum, you have a lot of different providers. A lot of times you have hospitalists uh, who are managing the patients. And some of those questions, salient questions that you and I would ask about, have you ever used compression before? Has, you know, is never asked. So by the time they get to the next setting, we are already behind the eight ball. And we're trying to initiate compression, but we don't know what they've had before, what they've been doing at home. And so we're, we're, we're spinning our wheels. And unfortunately, a lot of these settings were limited to what their formulary has. So as Heather was talking about how we really need to individualize the type of compression, we don't a lot of times have that option. When we get to home health, we have a little bit more um, possibility here. Unfortunately, we don't usually have a lot of lymphedema therapists to help the nursing staff in that home health setting. And again, we may be restricted again from that product selection from their formulary. Fortunately, the wound centers usually uh, have some better expertise. And so there may be a variety of compression options out there. And um, also, there's the ability to incorporate that research and that stride document and kind of match your, your dressings and your compression to the patient's needs. Now, there are a lot of challenges uh, in, in the dressing selection. So there um, was this uh, study done by Zara and Holm, et cetera. And what they found is that uh, the staff nurses were really concerned basically about the exudate and the peri wound condition. And then the, con the concern also was if they put a dressing on, is it going to work well under that compression? And of course, very often they're worried about the patient environment, but really what the, the nursing staff was begging for is they want something that's really absorbent, something that can expand that wear time, and then also to prevent the maceration that they usually see. And that's usually because your dressing isn't absorbing the way it should. So I always like to say uh, wound exudate management is all about lose the ooze, right? And you can see this patient is just dripping everywhere. Now we have to think about there are other risk factors for exudate uh, production. And you can see here, it's not necessarily, as Heather said, yes, it's lymph, but there are a lot of things that can contribute to that fluid overload in that leg. You know, heart failure, malnutrition, 
uh, low serum albumin levels, uh, endocrine disease. So, and then of course, medication. So don't forget to start looking at those medications. If they're on steroids, that's gonna be a problem. They're gonna collect fluid in that leg. ACE inhibitors are another uh, class of medications that always contribute to edema of that lower extremity. But how much is too much? Well, it's really interesting. Uh, when you start looking at the literature, everybody's measuring things a lot differently. So, um, you know, Dealey was just weighing the dressings, Thomas weighed the dressings. Um, some people actually, Dealey went back and actually looked at the amount of fluid was in the canister of negative pressure therapy devices. Uh, some people looked at uh, the evaporative loss. Uh, some people looked, used an actual evapor Vaporimeter, evaporimeter, evaporimeter. Okay, I got that. Uh, but there's really no good way and standardized way to figure out how much is normal. So that's difficult for all of us because it makes things very subjective. I really like this scale. This is uh, Marco Romanelli, um, Bowden, and Dot Weir's work. I like this because it's simple at the bedside. Anybody can use, you can interpret it. So if it's dry, this is what it is described as. And uh, the this is what the surrounding skin looks like. And if it's wet, um, this is small amounts of fluid. You can have a lot of, of um, drainage on it, but you don't have strike through. So any person, so whether they're a wound care provider or a non-wound care provider who's providing care for the patient can use this. So, you know, go ahead and please download it. Uh, it'll be in your resource pack and, and put it in the patient's packet. So people are really all under the same, using the same frame of reference. So choosing a dressing for venous leg ulcer is, it's very difficult. So you have you know, what type of compression are you using? What are the environmental factors that you're seeing here? Are they at the home? Is it um, hot out? Is it cold out? What kind of exudate level do they have? And then who's doing the dressing? Who's ma managing that, that patient? And on top of that, that may change. As Heather talked about, the amount of tension that people put on will vary from clinician to clinician and ultimately impact the patient. And the real question is, are foams the superior dressing? I think a lot of people think that they might be. Um, the answer is, is it no or is it maybe? And I think it actually kind of depends. And why is that? Well, I think when you um, look at the evidence, it was really low quality. The last time somebody really looked at this was in 2013. Um, half the RCTs had a risk of bias. And of course, and why is that? Well, foams are very different and they can be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. They can be hydrocellular. They can be polyurethane. They can hold a, either very low amounts of exudate or very high amounts of exudate. We, they um, can all reduce pain and infection rates that we know, uh, but low, you know, all along, we found in 2013, the RCTs are saying there's no significant difference in the healing rates. So the question really is, is that, is this, can you apply any foam in any situation? And the answer is no, as Heather was talking about, there are so many variables to managing a patient with venous disease and a venous leg ulcer that, it makes it very difficult to choose the right one at the right time, right? So um, it's very interesting because they, they knew way, way back historically that the environment that the foam is in makes a huge difference. So uh, way back when they used to, if in the winter, they would actually add white wax um, with oil and in the summer for these leg wounds, what they would do is not use um, oil at all. And then um, 
put them over the wounds because the temperature, and I think all of us in uh, the last couple of months have had some kind of extreme temperature. Arizona was up to 120, Portland and, and Seattle up to 110. Uh, the Northeast has been having a problem. So we have to remember that dressings are tested at a standard lab te uh, temperature, and that's 98.6. And the they're tested with the temperatures equal on both sides. And guess what? Our Let's say our body temperature is 98.6, but our environment is 110. So we, we're, we're getting some variety there and our phones are not gonna function the same way in that same environment. And same when you add some humidity. Uh, we have different humidities depending on where you are in the world. Also, your, your patient's daily temperatures may change. Uh, for example, when I'm in the wound clinic, they keep it probably 62 degrees and I go outside and uh, travel off to the nursing home and it may be close to 80, 85. And then again, we have to think about gravity. If your patient's legs are down, you're going to have some uh, variability there. Now, what about foams under compression? So actually they do minimally impact the moisture vapor transmission rate in lab uh, conditions. And that relative humidity in lab conditions is between 33 and 38%. And um, if there's no um, none, none or no to minimal leakage, uh, you can have um, when you your humidity um, increases up to 55 to 62%, your leakage will increase also. Again, it's all based on what the pr product can do. Gravity is always your enemy and how you're con dressing its construction will influence, influence your exudate leakage. So dressing construction really matters. So the, one of the things you have to think about is how the dressing is, is, is adhered to the wound. So you have to start looking at adhesives. So there are usually acrylic adhesives out there um, and also silicone adhesives. So the acrylics actually stick kind of right away, but then they kind of melt in between the, the gaps in the cells. And so you kind of like to use these if you need increased securement or if you need longer wear time. But the problem with the acrylics is that when you take them off, they have a pull force. And so you actually can uh, remove some epidermal cells with that. We certainly want to keep every cell we can on, on our patient. Now, the silicone adhesives actually start... Um, when, once they're on, they're on, and they don't really fill in those gaps, which are really nice because when you're taking the silicone off, you're not getting that huge pull force. And um, they're nice because they don't hurt our patients, that you can pick them up, reposition them, and they don't um, adversely affect traumatic removal of the epidermal cells except there is some research out there suggesting that we need to be looking a little bit differently at that. So 3M actually has a tegaderm silicone foam dressing and the construction is really interesting. You've got that medical grade silicone contact layer and then you have this foam layer that actually will hold up and bring, pull up that exudate. But what's nice, what's over that is that super absorbent layer. So you're now able to take lots of exudate and lock it in. And so on top of that, you have this vertical wicking. So you're not having this foam go spreading out that exudate and hurting that peri wound skin. Uh, you have a moisture control layer that actually will take that moisture vapor transmission late and, uh, take it through that topable top layer, which is breathable. And so you actually can reduce your, the, your, your extend your dressing time because you're getting rid of a lot of moisture vapor from the wound itself. Uh, it's got this really handy application att in attachment. And so you, you don't need three hands to get a dressing on anymore. So you just use one hand to place and then you're able to pull off these um, application enhancements really easy. 
So I kind of alluded to this already, not all silicones are the same. We're starting to see some research out there. So some of the um, dressings out there actually with silicone, uh, a, they will, some of them will pull up more epidermal cells and we know how important we want our cells, but we also see the differences in the absorption capability. So you're gonna to wanna to ask your sales rep when they're looking and trying to show you a, a silicone foam, you know, show us our, your absorption capability. Um, there, I have to do mention the super absorbent dressings. We kind of, I like to use these first before um, I go to a foam because when we're trying to get that leg down to um, the maximum uh, width and girth and get most of that edema out, you're draining like crazy, right? So Caramax Care is a super absorbent and um, the Caramax Care border dressing. So you, you can use both of these under compression. Uh, I have a tendency just to use the one without the border uh, underneath compression rather than those with the border. But I, I have on occasion used the gentle border dressing, uh, especially if I'm having the patient trying to do their own dressing and, and, and their own garments. And so I get less roll up, it's easier uh, for the patient to participate. Uh, remember application really matters and how you apply the dressing also really matters. So here's some uh, practical pearls. You wanna consider gravity because if your patient's gonna have that wound down or if they're gonna be lying in bed all day or in their um, recliner chair, things are gonna drip down. So, you know, diamonds can be your best friend, right? So you don't have to be perfectly square to uh, put your wound in the middle, put your, your wound up near one of the corners and, and let your gravity work for you. And also you wanna adjust the dressing changes according to the temperature and humidity. So you're gonna, on really hot summer days, really humid, you may have to increase the frequency to maybe every other day, maybe every third day, instead of every five to seven days. Um, remember that um, it's hard to compare a lot of these dressings because the bench data is again, all, done at under the same conditions and our patients are, don't live under the same conditions from house to house, location to location, country to country. And we really want to think about um, how we wanna avoid adverse events, right? So we have to think about how much edema is there and, and the kind of dressing you're putting on, especially your foam dressing, the tapered ed edges, such as the ones that we see with the silicone foam dressing that 3M has, actually reduces these huge indentations. Um, on the left, you actually can see when you're using a silicone that uh, dressing that may be less, um, even though it's a medical grade, the, the tack may be greater and you can actually pull up uh, skin there. Uh, and also you wanna think about the edges of that foam on the right. You can see if you don't use a tapered edge on the, your foam dressing under compression, you can actually cut in, cause, cause a, 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 another wound. And then your indentations. Again, um, multi-layer compression bandages often result in these deep indentations and can lead to new wounds. So again, finding uh, a silicone foam dressing that's got a tapered edge is can be really helpful here. And also we wanna think about um, how you want to use these foam dressings. A lot of times, you, you don't necessarily need a square dressing. Sometimes you need something that is, can catch all those little small ulcers all at once. So while we started thinking about uh, sacral dressings to use on oddly shaped legs or in wounds that you may have multiple wounds, there's an option here too. So you wanna find uh, that there's a variety of foams that uh, many manufacturers have, but 3M has also a number of shapes and sizes that you can use that can be very helpful. And again, we want to start thinking about when we want a visual 
So somebody knows when to change it, um, whether it be the caregiver, the home health nurse, the uh, the long-term care nurse, we want, people want visual feedback. So it's very easy to see this visual system that the 3M silicone foam dressings have. Here's a really great case. As you can see, this um, guy was draining a whole lot of fluid here and you can actually see down at the bottom, two things. You can see that there's some significant pseudomonas involved, but also look at the hair that's sticking out. So there's a number of, um, the dog hair that's sitting in this wound. So we know that we uh, need that something to put on this wound that's gonna control the bio burden. And we also know he's draining a lot. So I used actually a super absorbent here after I cleaned up this wound. And uh, by day three, you can see uh, that I'm starting to epithelialize. My um, amount of drainage is cutting down. My wound looks better. No dog hair there this time. Um, I actually changed to silicone foam on day 10. I'm getting almost a little too dry. I'm looking and ordering my stockings right away. And I am um, still using compression over this, just like I did with my silicone foam. And by day 28, I'm all healed. So I'm compressed and I'm healed and uh, we can move on to something uh, more permanent and maintenance therapy for him. And day 35, he still was closed. It looks great. He was able to get his stockings on and off. So I want to summarize. Uh, construction really matters on your foam dressing. It has to be able to function under different compression types. And you don't want to have any complications because you have enough, as well as holding the amount of exudate that you will encounter somewhere between the high level down to the low level. And I wanna thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna turn this over to Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather and Kathy for those great presentations. My name is Emily Greenstein and I'm a certified wound and ostomy nurse practitioner at Sanford Health in Fargo, North Dakota. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about what guides your therapy approach to a stalled wound with localized infection or biofilm in addition to putting it all together. So how do I know that a wound is infected? So a couple of things that we can do for easy remembering or uh, looking at clinical signs and symptoms of a localized infection. Thinking about those classic signs first. So is there pain? Is there redness? Heat, purulence, induration, any crepitance? any fluctuations, but then you need to remember in chronic wounds, we don't always see those classic signs of infection. So we could have a chronic wound that's just stalled out and it's not healing, but do we see any friable hypergranulation tissue is, that wasn't there before? Is there an increase in odor? Do you have a patient who's diabetic and had no feeling and all of a sudden they're complaining of very intense pain in their foot? Is there epithelial bridging or uneven granulation tissue? Has the wound not changed or is very stalled out? Do you start seeing the wound enlarging? Is there satellite lesions that are starting to appear around the wound? And then we also need to remember that not all red discoloration represents infection. Oftentimes I will see patients get admitted to the hospital for cellulitis. Uh, we get consulted, I go and see the patient and the patient has a history of chronic venous insufficiency. You elevate their leg for a couple of minutes and the redness goes away. So remembering that signs and symptoms of cellulitis and signs and symptoms of venous insufficiency are not the same. They mo both may present as a reddened limb However, cellulitis is usually confined to one limb. It's usually not bilaterally. And then you also need to look at other things when you're diagnosing cellulitis, looking at lab values. Is the patient's white count up? Um, do they have a fever? What's their CRP? And then uh, also looking at the patient's history. Do they have a history of chronic venous insufficiency? Have they been diagnosed with edema in the past? Have they had ulcers in the past? So when I talk about cellulitis, like I said, assess the patient's temperature. 
Ask them if they've had fever or chills. Check if the area is acutely inflamed. Um, ask the patients if they've noticed redness spreading. Did it start in my foot and now it's halfway up my leg? Is there any blistering? And then like I had said before, those lab tests are very important in differentiating guys cellulitis from chronic insufficiency, looking at WECs, C-reactive protein, and then the ESR rates. So this is an example of a patient who was diagnosed with cellulitis. They came in, um, we did their lab tests. Their WVCs were 23, normal is four to 11. Their CRP was elevated at 113. They also had an elevated temp as well as an elevated blood pressure and heart rate. And as you can see in this patient, she does have chronic venous insufficiency on the, but she also has cellulitis as indicated um, by the extending redness and then by her lab values as well. So when we look at how we're going to treat these wounds that are infected, um, we can look at this guide that came out for uh, wound infection in clinical practice. It was created by the Wound Infection Continuum International Wound Infection Institute. Um, it was published in Wounds International in 2016. So what it does is it kind of gives us an idea of what our wounds range from. So you can have a wound that goes all the way from contamination up to systemic infection. When we talk about biofilm, biofilm is going to be present more of that local infection colonization um, up to the systemic infection. When we look at treatment options, uh, when you have a wound that's just contaminated or colonized or might be kind of on the verge of that critical colonization, you really don't need an antimicrobial at that point. Once it becomes critically colonized or a localized infection is noted, that's when you want to start to look at the topical microbials. And then if you're getting spreading infection, you are going to look at um, using systemic interventions as well as topical. So when we look at topical therapies in particular, you can see that on the market, there's a lot of different products available. There's the enzymatics, iodine, uh, for our purposes, we're going to look specifically at the silver type of dressing. So silver salts, um, the, how silver works is it denatures existing bacterial biofilm in concentrations over 5 to 120. So what is the AG oxy salt technology? So the AG oxy salts is a dressing that contains a derivative of hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide and wound healing, we always often hear, you know, hydrogen peroxide is bad, it is cytotoxic, you don't want to use it to clean your wounds, and all of this is true. However, hydrogen peroxide is key to signal tissue damage. So it recruits inflammatory cells, it kills bacteria. So what happens is we have to come up with a way that we can utilize hydrogen peroxide for its effectiveness in the wound um, and in biofilm management. However, making it so that the levels are not cytotoxic. So in low concentrations, it can promote healing. And like I said, the high concentrations inhibit that healing. When we look at chronic wounds, there's excessive levels that create a hostile wound environment and cause tissue damage. So the hydrogen peroxide works by recruiting these inflammatory cells, killing the bacteria, which helps to promote a healing environment and kind of lower that hostile wound environment. So the silver oxy salts work by releasing hydrogen peroxide into oxygen, turning it into oxygen and water. So basically what's happening is the hydrogen peroxide is breaking down into water and oxygen molecules. The silver is then being released into the wound. It is um, bringing oxygen into that wound base as well. So you can see in this um, test that was done with the oxy salts against another dressing, the carousel AG dressing 
did, you can see it bubbling up on the top. It's releasing that oxygen into the wound bed versus some of the other competitors in the market, which don't have that component to it. They just have the silver component. So both of them do have um, silver, which is the antimicrobial. However, the extra added hydrogen peroxide, which is releasing oxygen into the tissue base, is also providing more nutrients to the wound bed. It assists with that breaking up of biofilm, and it also assists in some of that autolytic debridement of the wound. So now that we talked about biofilm management, um, is there another contributor to delayed healing that we need to acknowledge? So when we look at wound bed preparation, everybody knows the um, acronym and all of the talk by Dr. Schultz and his group about <clears throat> tissue, infection, moisture, and edge management. So when we look at this, we look at the tissue. Is it defective matrix and cellular debris? This requires debridement. Debridement restores the wound base and ECM proteins. <clears throat> And then we look at infection. We need to control this, decreasing um, bacterial counts by debridement, the use of antimicrobials, moisture balance, and then um, edge of the wound or looking, making sure there's no advancing or undermining of the wound. Now we'll talk about the role of inflammation in the wound. So when we look at inflammation, we need to take into uh, consideration the patient's comorbidities aging, if there's any ischemia or hypoxia, prolonged pressure or stress, all of these things can lead to an increase in inflammation. We can have pain, localized heat, friable granulation tissue, increase in exudate. But just because a wound is inflamed does not necessarily mean that it is infected. So now when we look at the inflammation in a wound, we think about our chronic wounds. They're oftentimes caught in the inflammatory stage, in the early stages of uh, inflammation. So right after the injury or the wound occurs, or right after we debride a wound, it gets put into that early stage of inflammation. At that early stage of inflammation is when you are looking at treating or controlling that biofilm uh, management of that. Once it gets into that late stage of inflammation, that's where you're looking at excessive proteases, increases in MMPs, um, the uh, cytokine activity is high in, the, in that phase, and we need to look at ways to control this. We also need to remember that not all inflammation is necessary infection. So one way that we can control inflammation topically is the, through the use of collagen or ORC matrices. The collagen ORC matrix wound dressing is composed of about 45% oxidative regenerated cellulose, about 55% of collagen. The AG matrix does also have that 1% of silver ORC in the dressing. So how collagen works, we will go over uh, the way that it helps to control MMPs and reduce that inflammation in the wound. So our goal in the inflammatory stage is to prevent it to getting stalled in that late inflammatory stage so that the wound can go on to the proliferation stage and on to healing. In that early stage, we have our um, pro-inflammatory macrophages and cytokines, our bacterial bile burden that needs to be controlled with good wound debridement. And then in the late stage, it is controlling our MMPs. So this is where the collagen um, dressing comes into play. I had it explained to me once that you have to think of this type of collagen more as a sacrificial dressing meaning you place this in the wound bed and the proteases and MMPs attack the dressing or the synthetic collagen and the body's natural collagen can then be activated and laid down, which results into the wound getting placed into that follicular stage and can go on to healing. So when I look at basic management of chronic wounds, we need to remember that um, 
regardless of what we do, what we put on the wound, we need to look at medical management also. So what is the underlying condition? We need to control blood sugars in our patients that are diabetic. We need revascularization if they have some uh, issues with blood flow, infection control, biofilm control, making sure that they're optimized nutritionally and underlying and controlling those underlying comorbidities. We also need to remember optimal wound care includes debridement, offloading of diabetic foot ulcers, offloading of pressure ulcers, compression therapy for our patients that have uh, lymphedema or venous stasis ulcers, and then the use of topical therapies. One thing that was put together to make the decision easy for when should we use our AG oxy salts and when should we use collagen? So selecting the right dressing at the right time. A simple guide that utilizes the white, yellow, red was developed. Um, what we looked at was their number of comorbidities that the patients had, if there was signs of inflammation, if there was non-viable tissue, if there was any signs of bio burden, and then the standard of care and the treatments. And then remembering that uh, the wound should be assessed uh, at two week intervals. And if the wound was not progressing or you weren't seeing any improvement, going back to the beginning and starting over with that risk stratification. So looking at that risk stratification, the patients were placed into a white, yellow, or red category. White meaning that they had no comorbidities, normal blood work, minimal psychosocial issues. Yellow meaning they had an underlying chronic disease. They may have abnormal blood work. They may have psychosocial issues. And then in the red, they had chronic disease, abnormal blood work, and then um, many psychosocial issues. Now we'll go over a couple of cases utilizing the risk stratification and treatment guide. So this is option one. This is a patient, he was a 28 year old male. He came in with a partial biggest burn <laughs> to his hand. He had no comorbidities, no psychosocial issues. So you can also see in the assessment of the wound, he had no signs of inflammation. So he was deemed a white level risk stratification. So the decision was made for standard of care, which included moist wound healing and wound bed preparation. Case two, this is a patient who's a 65 year old male. He had diagnosed vasculitis. He had venous insufficiency, no psychosocial issues. So he was into the yellow or red risk level. So we go down to, did he have any signs of inflammation? Or was there non-viable tissue present? You can see from the photographs that yes, there was non-viable tissue present. So we went to uh, wound bed preparation and then treatment with the silver oxy salt dressing. And you can see in this patient, um, the use of the silver, silver oxy salt dressing did increase granulation tissue in the wound bed. It did decrease uh, slough or non-viable tissue in the wound bed from day zero to day seven. And this patient was also treated with the Coban two-layer venous compression wrap. This is an example number three. So this patient was a 56-year-old male. It was a traumatic wound. He had had an extensive history of AFib hypertension. He was on Coumadin. He had no psychosocial issues. So he was deemed a yellow or red risk level. There was signs of inflammation. So was there signs of bio burden? Yes heavy bio burden or risk for bio film development. He was at high risk for that. So we did utilize the silver oxy salt dressing. And as you can see, like with the previous patient, he had an increase in granulation tissue. He had a decrease in slough. You can see there's a lot less um, just dead cellular debris within the wound bed after seven days. This is an example of an option four. This is a patient, she's a 76 year old female. She had a failed flap on her head. She had melanoma, she had a history of dementia and alcoholism. <clears throat> so she was deemed a red or yellow risk level. She had no signs of um, necessarily inflammation. She did have some signs of bile burden. She was also at risk for infection given her age and the location of the wound. So 
with her, we decided to use the ORC collagen dressing. Um, we did use the AG because of her risk for infection. And as you can see, um, from day zero to the three months, she did progress to healing quite well. So this is option five. This is a patient who had a DFU. He had diabetes, he had peripheral vascular disease, but he didn't really have any psychosocial issues. He was deemed a yellow risk level. He had no non-viable tissue in the wound base that you can see. He did not have any signs of an increased um, bile burden or risk for infection. So for him, we decided just to use the ORC dressing. This was applied weekly, along with offloading through a total contact cast. So overall, um, the evaluation and treatment of wounds, we need to remember a couple of goals. We need to keep in mind to assess and record wound progress at a maximum level of two week intervals. So if you're not really seeing any changes in your wound, after two weeks, you need to start over, look over, is there something that we're missing? Uh, studies have shown that a 50% reduction in wound surface area after four weeks is a reliable indicator for wound healing in diabetic and venous stasis leg ulcers. Mm -hmm. If no change in your wound, you need to document uh, presumed barriers to healing. So is the patient compliant? Is there um, something else that's not controlled? Is one of their underlying disorders um, not being controlled? Is their A1C extremely high? Uh, and then consider future further diagnostic testing, um, making sure that anyone who has uh, leg ulcers is getting uh, an ABI or getting a, a venous duplex if it is uh, venous disease, making sure that you're culturing the wound if it's appropriate, and then biopsying wounds also. And then we also need to look at um, this idea of healability. We need to assess the healability. Is this wound going to heal or is this more of a maintenance or palliative type therapy? That concludes this presentation. Thank you again to Heather and Kathy for their great presentations. Thank you for joining us.